On a morning in August 1973, Jan Erik Olsen walked into a Swedish bank armed with a submachine gun. Firing several rounds and injuring one police officer, Olsen demanded that his friend Clark Olofsson be released from prison to join him. After the Swedish government relented, the pair took four hostages and barricaded themselves inside the bank's vault. What unfolded in that small space over the course of the next six days would become known as Stockholm Syndrome. Even though the hostages were repeatedly threatened with death unless the demands of the hostage takers for money and weapons was met, the hostages themselves appeared to bond with their captors. While the actions of the police were probably a contributing factor, the level of positivity shown towards the hostage takers was still perplexing to both public and police alike. Amongst a variety of other things, they attempted to protect the two hostage takers when they were surrendering to police at the end, they hugged and kissed them as they said their goodbyes, and at least one hostage visited one of the hostage takers in prison afterwards. Some of the hostages themselves were even confused. Speaking with a psychiatrist afterwards, one of them asked, Is there something wrong with me? Why don't I hate them? Stockholm Syndrome was a term coined by the media and isn't officially recognised as a psychological condition. Despite that, researchers have hypothesised conditions in which it might be found to occur. One of the most widely cited proposes four precursors. That those taken hostage perceive a genuine threat to their own survival. That the hostages are isolated from the perspectives of anyone other than their captors. That the hostages perceive some element of kindness on the part of their captors. And that the hostages feel powerless to control their situation. What's striking about this, I think, are the parallels to core aspects of Christianity and Islam. After all, they tell us that our lives are overseen by a supreme power that is inescapable, all-knowing, and punishing. No human knowledge or wisdom can challenge the perspective of this being. From virtue of what it is, it is the ultimate authority on all possible matters of truth. While this being is said to hold infinite unwavering love for us, it is also said to see us as spiritually corrupt and broken as a result of spiritual errors that we are continually making. In short, it's as if we're trapped inside God's celestial bank vault, and not only are there no police waiting outside to rescue us, we are continually and inescapably doing things that we deserve to be profoundly punished for. While religions like Christianity and Islam certainly do help protect people against very real fears and anxieties connected with our material existences, they do this only at the cost of introducing powerful fears and anxieties of their own. The result is a bit of a nightmare. A layered set of anxiety and fear, protecting against other anxieties and fears, and all held together by the fragile glue of ancient stories of God's love and miracles. None of this is fun to point out, and I think the correct response towards those who devoutly believe should be one of compassion. I think if people are going to believe in God, they may as well believe in the most beautiful and reasonable version of that idea they can think of. Of course, what that looks like for you might be quite different from what it looks like for me but it should look very different from what people living thousands of years ago happened to believe, given the nature of their beliefs. We should want to hold the idea of God to scrutiny and tease it apart, see what it implies and all the things that it stands on, and have curiosity enough to explore different options for it. If we do that, I think it will quickly become clear that the fears we've attached have been misplaced all along, 